Good morning, church. It is a different thing to be in the sanctuary this morning, but I am so glad that y'all are here. And we have been displaced by some bounce houses this Sunday. And I have started a petition with our confirmands to preach from the bounce house next year. So if you're interested in that, we have that in the back if you want to know more. But this Sunday, we are starting a new sermon series, and it kind of works that we are in the sanctuary here together because we're kicking it old school, church style. This Sunday, we begin a new sermon series called Origin Story, where we are looking at some of the heroes of our faith, looking more closely at some of the things that happened to make the people of God who they are. An origin story may be a familiar term to you, usually involves going to the roots or the beginning, learning about maybe how a superhero or supervillain came to be the way that they are. For example, Superman's origin story tells us that he is an alien from the planet Krypton, or that Wonder Woman was sculpted from clay and given powers by the Greek gods. Spider-Man's story, of course, tells us that you should be afraid of spiders. We don't know where they have been. But for the people of Israel and the following Christians, the classic origin story of our faith is the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament. And through its stories, it tells how the people of Israel and us, how the people of God came to be. And in superhero comics, they tell us something important about what that hero is, who they are, what matters to them. And we learn those same lessons by going back and understanding the origin story of our faith, the origin story of the people of God. And so my hope is that every fall we can return to some of these great heroes of the faith from the Hebrew Bible, everyone from Abraham to the prophet Deborah. And by looking at their stories, noticing what they have to teach us about what it means to be the people of God today. And so this morning, we begin with a classic Old Testament hero As Mr. Bill has already told us with his spectacular coat, we are talking about Joseph, the dreamer. Because way back in Genesis 12, Abraham was given a promise. He was given a promise by God that he would have a people and a place and a purpose, and that through his family, all the world would be blessed. And so that promise began. And it has come down through Abraham and Sarah, through Isaac and Rebekah, all the way to Esau and Jacob, and now to Jacob's 12 sons, the youngest of which is Joseph. And now, when you read a book in contemporary life, every once in a while, they put something called content warnings in it. Genesis needs a content warning. If y'all have never read this book, front to end. Let's just say you'll feel better about your family after we're done reading, okay? So we are beginning in chapter 37 in the book of Genesis. We are talking about the story of Joseph, and along the way we will pause and reflect, we'll take note, and we'll notice what this origin story of the faith has to teach us about what it means to be the people of God today. So from Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. It says, Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, also known as Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves or a technicolor dream coat. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So we're going to take a moment and pause right there. Because only in these first four verses, we have learned quite a bit about Joseph. What have we learned? He's a snitch. He has gone with his older brothers and reported poorly on them to his dad, already being the favorite. He's not 
doing himself a lot of favors. He has this fancy robe that was a gift from his father to him, a clear marker of his evidence as favorite. Here are some depictions that we have seen of that, that dream coat. It perhaps wasn't as rainbow in real life, but it was fancy. It was a distinction. But Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph, his youngest son, more than any of his others. And he made that clear. I wouldn't recommend doing that as a parent. Don't have a favorite at all, but definitely don't give them a fancy coat. But that's not where it ends for Joseph. In fact, he kind of digs himself a deeper hole with him and his brothers. Because having this fancy coat and reporting on his brothers poorly was not enough. Instead, he has a dream. And in it, he sees all of his brothers and him together binding together grain. When all of a sudden, his grain is lifted up and all of the other bounds of grain bow down to it. Now you're a 17 year old boy. You're the youngest son. You know that you're the favorite. There are a lot of things you could do to try to mitigate that relationship with your brothers, to kind of patch things up. You know what doesn't help? Running to your brothers and saying, hey, guess what dream I just had? In it, all of you bowed down to me. What do you think that's about? (laughs) But that's not enough. He does it again. He has another dream where he sees 11 stars and a sun and moon all bow down to him. And he has 11 brothers and a mom and a dad. A coincidence? Probably not. So the tension between Joseph and his brothers are growing. Joseph is clearly not his best self at 17 years old, and the brothers are growing more and more wary of him. It says they cannot even speak peaceably to him. It's like what your mom says, if you can't say anything nice, say nothing at all. They're saying nothing at all over and over. And so we're picking up in verse 12, where he has shared these dreams with his brothers, and here is what happens next. Verse 12 says, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him wandering in the field, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph was after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So he goes a little further down the road. And one of my friends tells this story, he likes to say, it's just a little bit farther enough so you won't be able to hear any screams. Don't worry about it. It's about to get worse. They saw him at a distance before he came near them. They conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. I think another translation of those words are, here comes this master of dreams. You can feel that tension and sarcasm and antagonism between those brothers. And it will only get worse. In verse 20, it says, Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness but lay no hand on him. He said that so that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So Reuben, the oldest brother, is going to have them throw him in this pit, and then when they aren't looking, save him out of the pit and bring him back to their dad. But in verse 23, it says, So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him in a pit. The pit was empty, There was no water in it. So you would have a cistern in this time, something that's cut from the rock that they would use to collect rainwater during times of drought. And that is what Joseph has been thrown into. It's the kind of thing you cannot get out of on your own. But his brothers are then so callous. In verse 25 it says, Then they sat down to eat. 
And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Then they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. Now, friends, it's really important how we handle Scripture, how we hold it and interpret it, how we live it out as the Word of God. And I think it's good that we have different opinions on what that means, even in this room alone. But I do want to be clear. Just because something happens in the Bible does not mean you should do it, especially with this text. And it matters what you think and how you interpret and what you believe about Scripture. Because maybe parents especially, one day your kid could come to you and say, you know, I kind of think we should sell our sibling to the circus. And you could say, why? And they could say, well, it's biblical. And they're not wrong. (laughs) But don't do it. (laughs) And so it matters how we think about this text. It matters what we think about these origin stories. And what I love about this story is that it goes on to become one of the most comforting tales that we get in Scripture. It becomes a story about love and faithfulness and the provision of God. But friends, look where it starts. This story is dark. It involves plots of murder and favoritism and unhealthy families, an unworthy hero, It has so much hate that it leads people closest to him, not just abandoning him, but throwing him in a pit. That's the origin story of Joseph. In fact, it's not unlike the hero's journey. This is a common literary device through which writers can map out some of the stories that mean most to us. And it starts with a call to adventure, with some help from mentors or guidance, It comes through problems and perils, and right there at the bottom of the story, the end of Act 3, we might say, it ends with a pit. That means the lowest of the low. And from there, they will learn new things. They'll gain new powers. They'll grow in knowledge, and they will return. But the pit for Joseph is an actual, literal pit in the ground. And his story full of problems and perils, is just beginning. And for those of us who have seen Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat or know this story from VBS or Children's Church, we know this is not where the story ends, that God will do a new thing even with these circumstances, but there's no denying the harsh reality that Joseph finds himself in in our text. There's no denying the real pain and hurt of this circumstance, of a young man who was given a dream, and almost as soon as he has it, it seems to be broken beyond repair. And I wonder why this story, the story of Joseph, seems to have such a hold on us as the people of faith. Perhaps it was because of the time that these stories were bound together, these texts that became scripture, was during a moment when Israel itself was in a pit, at least a metaphorical one. Most biblical scholars believe that these texts were first written down and organized during the exile, that time when the people of Israel had been brought into their promised land, only to lose it to become captive to another foreign empire. And there was a clear narrative then, one that I think is prevalent still to this day, that if things are going wrong, if your dream is deferred, if the unexpected happens and not in a good way, it must mean that God has left you, that God has abandoned you, that God is certainly not for you. 
And for the people of Israel, they believed that perhaps God had led them into that promised land, but if they were being taken out of it, then God wasn't going with them. And I'm not sure if we don't think the same thing. We tend to live in a Christian culture that tells us if things are going well, then God is with us. God is on our side. But that moment that plans start to slip or fall through or tragedy happens, we have lost God's favor or God is no longer with us. And we call that line of thinking prosperity gospel. It's that idea that if we believe well enough, if we have enough faith, if we live faithfully enough, God will give us health and wealth and prosperity in this life. And for those of us who live in the real world, where accidents do happen, where tragedy does occur, where we are victims and beneficiaries of one another's God-given free will, it can feel like if that dream God has given us doesn't come to fruition, if we don't have that perfect family or if sickness gets in the way or that perfect job or that perfect faith, God must have seen us in this mess and have left us like Joseph in that pit. That was the narrative that the Israelites could have held on to as they were moved away from that land promised to them all the way back in Genesis 12. They could have believed that God had given up on them so that they would finally fully give up on God. But instead, in that time of exile, they took these stories, their history and their culture, and they bound it together. They recognized God's word. They remembered and cataloged their origin story, including the story of Joseph. What we find in this text is that neither the dreamer nor the dream is really dead. What we find is that God does not leave him, Joseph, in the mess of his circumstance. God doesn't even leave Joseph in the mess that he himself is. I don't know if you were also a mess at 17, but I relate to Joseph maybe a little bit too much. God doesn't leave Joseph in the mess that he finds himself in. Instead, God goes into the mess with him. And this text comes from the lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of scripture used so that you aren't just hearing the preacher's favorite stories, but you get the whole length and breadth of scripture. And we don't always follow the lectionary in order because we work on sermon series, but each Sunday there's a little bit of gospel Old Testament, New Testament letters, and Psalms. And so when we prepare a text, I like to look at what the lectionary writers had paired it together with. What other themes were they trying to draw out of this text through the way that they structure it with other parts of Scripture? And this text is paired with part of the Gospel in Matthew chapter 14, which is Peter walking out to Jesus on the waves. I'm sure for many of us, the story is very familiar. Jesus walks up to a boat where all of his disciples are, but he doesn't walk on land. Instead, in the midst of a storm, he walks to them on water, and Peter, his disciple, so excited, runs out to meet Jesus on the waves. But then he catches sight of just how intense that storm is. He sees the reality of the wind in the waves. He looks away from Jesus, and he starts to sink. And it's then that Jesus offers him a hand, says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And I love the pairing of that together, because I think it allows us to see both the reality of the harshness of Peter's and Joseph's and maybe our own situation. I know this is a story both of them really are often told to children, but when we read it with adult eyes, friends, some of this is dark. It's real, maybe too real for what we expect in Scripture. In these few verses alone, like we've already said, family dysfunction and unequal power and human trafficking. 
And yet we know what will happen is that God will use the evil acts in the story to bring good for all. That doesn't clear up the mess that Joseph is facing. Or maybe even we ourselves are facing. But it reminds us that we don't face it alone. That we don't serve a God who walks out on mess, but instead steps into the mess with us. And friends, that's our story. It was the story of the Israelites as they walked from Egypt to exile. It's what might be bringing them back to this text time and time again. And for us as well. Because to know the story of our Savior, to be a Christian, is to say that we serve a God who died on the cross for the least and the lost and the without. Friends, that means that we serve a God who doesn't look on mess and walks away. That means that we serve a God who in loving compassion sits with us no matter the circumstance. That those circumstances aren't indicative of God's favor or love toward us. We find evidence of that favor and that love in God being with us no matter what we're facing. And every time we communicate the gospel, we share and live out and read and remind each other of that good news. And so because we're in the sanctuary this morning, I feel like I get to do something a little more old school than usual. I'm going to have y'all look at a creed that we say together. This one was formed in 1968 from the United Church of Canada, and you don't have to say it along with me. I'll read it to you. But I wonder if just like that story of Joseph, it needs to be shared. It says, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. And I love that it begins and ends the same way. Because the story of Joseph will change. The circumstances will get better. Joseph himself will get better. But the origin story of him, of the people of God, tells us this. No matter our circumstances, we are not alone. So friends, where do you need to be reminded that God is with you? In what situation do you need to hear that God has stepped into the mess alongside you? How are you being invited to remind others that they are not alone? That no matter what they are facing, God is walking alongside them And so are you. How are you being called to be like the God that you serve and walking with others no matter the season? As we close this morning, I'd like to share with you all a quick story. It comes from an Episcopalian priest, Tish Harrison Warren, in her book, Prayer in the Nights, which is all about how do we sit with the reality of God's goodness and the suffering of the world. And she talks about going on this hike in Scotland, which for me means a lot because that's where my sister lives, so of course I love it. But she's up in the highlands and there's so much fog that as she's walking along, she can't even really see what's ahead. But as she walks every once in a while, just when she feels like she is truly lost, there's a little marker along the trail, a little sign that says someone has been here you're not alone. You're still heading the right way. And she says that it's almost at those moments when it feels like there is simply not another marker left on this trail, that she feels well and truly and completely lost that she finds another. Friends, the story of Joseph is like those markers on the trail. 
It reminds us that someone has been here, that someone is here, that we are not alone. And as people of God, we are invited to be those markers on the trail for somebody else, to witness with our lives and our words and our love that no matter what the world is facing, God has not left it, that we live in God's world, that we are not alone. May it ever be so. Amen.